It is August 17th of 1943. B-17s of the 100th Bomb Group roar over Germany. Their destination, the aircraft and ball bearing factories at Regensburg and Schweinfurt. But also at this moment, not only are German anti-aircraft crews locking in and preparing to defend their cities, Luftwaffe fighters led by skilled aces from airfields all across Europe have taken off and are now en route to intercept. In this formation that will soon be at the center of a bloodbath is one B-17, simply named Maybe. And it is here that we find our three heroes. One co-pilot, one top turret engineer, and one waste gunner. Their story shows what it was truly like to be a member of the Bloody Hundredth on one of the deadliest missions of the war. So let's dive into the records, discover the history, and relive the mission. If you enjoy this forgotten story from the 100th Bomb Group, then you will love this. A letter written to a member of the 100th just days before he was shot down. And you'll only find history like this with this video's sponsor, Letters from War. Letters from War is my personal project where each month I hunt down and send out historic letters and documents from World War II. Each packet gives you a look inside what it was like to serve, fight, and sometimes even lose a loved one during the war. Get a look at handwritten letters, historic records, and all sorts of history from the heroes of World War II, sent right to you. And next month's is going to be this, a bonus letter sent to one of the airmen in this very story. Make sure to watch till the end to see exactly what it'll be, and join Letters from War at the link below so you don't miss it. Now, on to the story. To start with, let's look at these crew members, and perhaps even pick one to follow, and to take the shoes of and see what fate has in store as we head to the briefing tent on August 17th of 1943. As we ride to the briefing room, it is extremely early, far earlier than normal for a mission briefing. But furthermore, as you are prepared for this mission, the crews have been given extra rations as well as blankets and money. This is not something that goes unnoticed. This is, in fact, a dead giveaway that the bomber crews will not be coming back to the airfield after the raid. Instead, we will be continuing on to some other destination after we hit our target. It is clear that we are in for a long day, but where are we going? The target for the famously brutal mission on August 17th would be the aircraft factories at Regensburg as well as the ball bearing plants at Schweinfurt. These are both well inside of Germany. The 100th was specifically assigned to hit Regensburg, and then following the bombing of this target would continue on south, across the Mediterranean and into North Africa where they would land at a U.S. airbase there instead of returning all the way back to England. And worst of all, they were to do all of this without fighter escort, as this tactic was not prominently utilized this early in the war, and even when it was, Allied fighters lacked sufficient range to be effective. It was bound to be a long and difficult mission, but little did they know that it would be far deadlier than even they imagined as the Germans, in reality, likely knew that the Americans were coming. As the crews headed to their planes, our three crew members all head to a B-17 by the name of Maybe, named appropriately by their navigator, who said, maybe they make it back, maybe they don't. On to here, all three of our heroes climb in. First, the right waist gunner, a 20-year-old from Syracuse, Staff Sergeant Kenneth T. O'Connor, on his fifth mission. O'Connor was a well-liked member of the crew, but as we will find out later, had one particular fear that would prove to be a problem. Then top turret gunner engineer, Staff Sergeant Richard Tex Bowler. Tex had truly one of the most interesting stories in the 100th Bomb Group. In the States, he participated in gunnery training, preparing to come over as one of the air crews in England. But an arm injury struck in training and saw him relegated to the grounds crews. However, his heart remained in the sky, and after arriving in England, he argued to be given another shot as a gunner. Eventually, this was granted, and he was reassigned to a top turret engineer. He flew his first mission, no doubt one that filled him with joy to be back in the sky on August 15th. 
And now, two days later, he was taking off for his second with the crew of Maybe, filling in for one of their gunners who was injured in an accident on base. And finally, Lieutenant Michael Dorowski from Long Island, New York. Dorowski, seen here in a 1943 newspaper, was the co-pilot of Maybe, and along with their pilot, Thomas Hummel was in charge of the aircraft. Now, with the bombers taking off and starting to form up over the channel, we have to pause and look at this. This is a never-before-seen letter that was sent to Michael Dorowski, 350th Bomb Squadron, 100th Bomb Group, on August 15th of 1943, two days before this mission. And at this moment, it was likely being loaded into a truck in New York City and headed to the post office bound for Lieutenant Dorowski. But if you notice, this letter is marked return to sender. Why might this be? Well, we are about to find out. Maybe joins the formation along with the other B-17s of the 100th Bomb Group. And slowly, they cross the English Channel and at approximately 10 a.m. begin to see France below them. The quiet air would not last long, however, as almost immediately, specks were spotted on the horizon, German fighters. And today, they would come up in full force and hungry for blood. These first groups would be fighters of JG-26, and shortly after that, JG-1, and then JG-3 all of which were seasoned fighter groups with skilled aces at this time in 1943. As the attacks rolled in and the formations began to take damage, things seemed odd. The attacks were almost perfectly timed, and as the Messerschmitts rolled in, it was as if one group finished up their attacks and another one was ready there to take its place. The Germans were operating almost like a shuttle service, escorting the bombers from the coast of France all the way to Regensburg. As time went on and the bombers defended, the attacks continued almost without ceasing. On board of Maybe, as they crossed France, Michael Dorowski was hard at work, swapping out pilot responsibilities with Lieutenant Hummels to keep their plane in formation, fighting hard to avoid the chaos and debris that was flying in every direction around them. Tex Bowler, at the same time, manning his top turret, was firing away at the fighters that never seemed to take a break. After arguing hard to get back onto a bomber crew, he was now getting everything he wanted, and then some. Just a few feet behind him, Staff Sergeant Kenneth O'Connor was unloading everything that he had as well. On his first four missions, he had never seen anything like this. In fact, an intercept like this, lasting this long, was totally unheard of. At this point, both of them hadn't ceased firing for nearly an hour. But with bombers falling out of the sky and lead flying in every direction, maybe was not the only thing trying desperately to reach its destination. Also, just beginning its long journey, crossing the Atlantic, was the letter to Michael. The writer would be Helen Dorowski, Michael's older sister. Here, she was checking in on her little brother. August 15th, 1943. Dear Mike, I am continuing in writing you, hoping you receive my letters. I think a little news is better than none. We are all well and do hope you are well, safe and happy. John called Mom up last night. Everything is fine at home. Unfortunately, at this moment, everything might have been just fine at home, but things were far from fine with the 100th Bomb Group. As they continued on and crossed into Germany, the fighter defenses only got heavier. The fighter opposition, in fact, was so thick on this mission that some have theorized that the Germans may have known, or guessed correctly, the direction and path of this bombing raid. We can in fact see here just how brutal this flight path was by looking at one of the post-mission maps from the Schweinfurt Force, which flew right next to the 100th Bomb Group. On this map, each dot represents an attack by a different group of German aircraft, identified by their color below. And as you can see, the attacks were constant and unrelenting in an almost organized manner. And the results showed. By 11.30, from the Regensburg Force, more than 10 planes had already been lost from the bomb groups of the 8th Air Force. 
And simultaneously, the Germans stepped up their attacks, raining all sorts of fire onto the force. And these were not just Messerschmitt 109s and Focke-Wulf 190s. By now, the Germans had thrown up everything possible to strike the attacking force, including twin-engine ME-110s and fighter-bomber Ju-88s. With every passing minute, it seemed like things got worse. At a time like this, a crew member could really use some good news. News like that, which was in his letter thousands of miles away. Well, I am happy to say that Mrs. Olasky is now feeling better. Johnny, of the other family, is the father of twin daughters, but it looks bad for the father. Perhaps soon John will have to be in the army. I know quite a few married men from Southampton that have arrived safely in England. But I must also share that unfortunately, Ray Green is missing in action in the Pacific. But if nothing else, the weather is beautiful today and it is clear and quite cool for August. John and Teddy are both busy at the club and little Robert is napping. Michael and the crew no doubt longed for a cool nap on a calm August day. But instead, they were here, 18,000 feet above Germany, in trouble. Although Maybe's crew was doing everything they could to defend the ship at this moment, they simply couldn't hold off the attack forever. Staff Sergeant O'Connor in the waist continued to fire, and was likely low on ammunition at this point meaning that he could do very little to stop the attacks that were coming wave after wave. Tex Bowler in the top turret was likely in a similar spot, but unfortunately he would find himself in the wrong place at the wrong time. Just after 11.30 a.m., an ME 109 pulled into the 2 o'clock high position on Maybe and dove in. Based on the time and location of this claim, the German pilot was likely Ernst Florian a young ace with 10 kills already to his name. The Luftwaffe pilot pulled the trigger and his rounds drilled the fortress in the center and left wing, with one of them finding Tex Bowler. In his position at the top turret, he began slowly bleeding very heavily, but was still awake. The B-17 in this same strike caught fire in the left wing, and slowly the fortress turned to the left and began to dive away towards the German countryside. Immediately, Captain Hummels recognized that Maybe was finished. They had received a death blow and the fire would not be extinguished. The bailout ring was sounded and the crew was ordered to get out of the aircraft. Well, Mike, we keep on praying for your safety. Hope you do not have to put up with too much hardship. John, Teddy, Robert, and myself are giving you our best regards and hope you can soon return home safely and in the best of health. May God bless you. Love, Helen and the family. Mike's health at this moment was not looking too good, and he was no doubt praying as well for God to keep him alive. As maybe now engulfed in flames, plummeted downwards, the first of the crew got out safely, one after another. Tail gunner, bombardier, radio operator, and the rest began to slowly leap from their exits. But before everyone could get out, the aircraft exploded in midair, becoming one of nine aircraft lost by the 100th bomb group that day. The pieces of maybe floated down to the ground as they burned, another casualty of the deadly raid, going down just a few miles short of Regensburg. But what happened to her crew? Was Kenneth O'Connor able to get out of the plane? Did Tex Bowler get patched up? And would Michael Dorosky live to eventually read his letter? This would take a while to piece together, as information took time to gather and reports were varied. Captain Bernard DeMarco from B-17 Our Baby, also in the 100th Bomb Group, listed that he saw the aircraft blow up, but only saw three parachutes. This would fortunately be incorrect, but for weeks that is all the information that would be available. That is, until the Germans reported that eight POWs had indeed been captured, with the remaining two crew members from Maybe killed in action. 
Fortunately for Helen Dorosky, one of the shoots that landed on the ground safely would be her brother, Michael. But he would see quite a bit before landing, and it would be his testimony that would shed light onto the two casualties from his plane. Here we can see the missing aircrew report with casualty forms signed by none other than Michael Dorosky. Here he writes about the first casualty, Staff Sergeant Kenneth O'Connor. The report reads, The last confirmed location I saw Sergeant O'Connor was at his gun. Here about five minutes before the German fighter shot us down, he reported everything was all right. Once we were hit, he strangely acted very calm and remained at his gun firing away. But he wasn't wearing his parachute, and shortly thereafter, the plane exploded. This last information was reported to me by the ball turret gunner, who was the last to leave the aircraft from the rear. And unfortunately, I believe he had no plans to bail out, as he himself told me that he was scared to bail out before the mission. In addition to Michael's report, another was given by one of the other surviving crew members, who stated, After being captured, the crew member stationed in the rear part of the aircraft said he appeared unimpaired, but stood looking out the window at the fire in the left wing. Whether he was afraid to jump or groggy from lack of oxygen. I can't say. This would also line up with one of the other statements saying that O'Connor may not have had sufficient oxygen as he was always having trouble with his mask fitting properly. But regardless, tragically, Staff Sergeant Kenneth T. O'Connor would remain with the bomber, dying in the explosion or when the wreckage of the plane struck the ground. He would be the first crew member from maybe that would be lost. But what about the second? Sergeant Tex Baller's loss would be a little more complicated, as he was the only crew member hit and injured when the fighter attacked. And once again, this can only be pieced together by the reports of his fellow crew members. At the time of bailing out, I got a hold of Sergeant Baller's shoulder and told him to bail out. Uh, he appeared to be slumped over and appeared to be disconnecting his attachments when I left the plane. I do, however, believe that Sergeant Bowler was injured. When I was passing him in the bomber, I brushed against him before I bailed out. Upon landing, I realized that I had blood stains on my flying suit and on the back of my legs, yet I was not injured there. This could have only come from Bowler. I believe that when the 109 came and attacked us from two o'clock, he missed the front of our bomber and struck the top turret where Sergeant Bowler was. I believe that this injury was fatal, and he never bailed out because of it. Again, signed, Michael Dorosky. In this After Action report, Lieutenant Dorosky once again tells everything that he knows, trying to put to rest the story of what happened to Sergeant Baller. But since he left the plane, he did not have any more details after that moment. Thus, the truth would not be realized until another report came in from Lieutenant Hummels, the captain of the ship. I know that he bailed out because in doing so, he took my parachute. I used his. Alas, upon hitting the ground after bailing out, I counted eight chutes still in the air. He was badly wounded and there was a lot of blood inside his position. Apparently, when Hummels was about to leave, Sergeant Bowler took his chute, showing that he did indeed exit the ship. But furthermore, he also counted eight parachutes after landing. Because of this, the conclusion was eventually made that Staff Sergeant Richard Tex Bowler likely died from his wounds either during the descent or shortly after hitting the ground. This would be the tragic loss of a 100th bomb group hero who tried so desperately to be put back on an air crew only to be killed in his second mission after being granted his request. In those few minutes after the attack, the wreckage of Maybe tumbled down to earth, and here one famous photo was snapped. This is the tail section of B-17-42-30311, also known as Maybe. And standing on her tail, a German pilot is looking over his prey. It would become a famous photo and one that showed all that was left after the carnage of August 17, 1943. For Michael Dorosky, his letter would be marked Return to Sender, as he was no longer at the airbase. On the back of the envelope, we can see why. 
one month later, he was officially registered as a prisoner of war, captured by the Germans. He would remain here until the end of the war, 20 months later. Maybe would go down as one of nine aircraft lost in the Regensburg Schweinfurt raid, and this mission would be one of the deadliest of the war for the 8th Air Force. And you might have read that before, but I can guarantee that you've never read this, a small card also written to Michael Dorowski on August 15th of 1943. This was included in Helen's envelope, but this one from his nephew, the little son of Helen. I'll be sharing this one as part of my project, Letters from War. So if you want to read this touching letter written to Uncle Mike days before he was shot down, join Letters from War at the link below and get all sorts of great history delivered right to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.